Hi, this is Leland Snyder for Frack Times. Today we're talking with Yuri Gorby, PhD geomicrobiologist, and he's going to tell us his experience with dealing with funding cuts at the U.S. Department of Energy. He's also going to tell us his knowledge of and experience with the fracking study that came out of the Energy Institute at UT Austin that said that fracking does not contaminate groundwater. So let's, uh, let's listen in and see what he has to say. I joined the U.S. Department of Energy National Lab in, uh, I think it was 1991. And I, uh, I went out to Hanford, Washington. I became part of a scientific core of, of multidisciplinary researchers, geochemists, hydrologists, microbiologists, modelers. And we worked together to try to understand the, the complex interactions of uh, bacteria, water, minerals, and how all these interactions uh, affected the migration of these contaminants in groundwater. And during that time, from 1991 up till about 2005, we had lots of funding to study. You know, these we had field demonstrations. We had um, by you know like every uh, meetings, uh, large integrated meetings at least once a year, more likely twice a year. We published lots of papers. Um, we developed a, a, a collaborative group, and I call it like, like my scientific community, and sometimes people take that wrong, but I mean, this was a really a, an integrated group of advanced scientists from different disciplines uh, that were, that worked together like I had, I, it was one of the best times of my scientific career because there were hundreds of people working on different projects, and we would all come together and we compiled data, compare that we would generate not just you know reports that would be submitted to Department of Energy, but published uh, data. I think that uh, yeah, for 15 years and the 10 years prior to my getting onto the scene and bringing these uranium-reducing bacteria, that component to that integrated uh, team of subsurface science researchers, it was a, a well-funded, productive, and very important like activity that was going on in the national lab systems. But in 2005, <clears throat> I noticed that there was a change in, in the funding available for our type of <laughs> science. And you can comment or you can get comments from any of my uh, colleagues that worked with me during that time. That from 2005 onward until today, in fact, until just about six months ago when we had almost our swan song of, uh, you know, we, no more funding left. People don't have funding to do the research. We have, a, you know, what are we going to do next? Half of our funding has been cut. Uh, they've crammed in atmospheric uh, modeling systems into the subsurface science research. So it's like you cut the funding, you expand the scope, you effectively dilute out the system so nothing can get done that's productive. And that's, that's the state of affairs right now. And it's tragic. When I started like getting into hydrofracking, I, I, and I started reading the 2005 Energy Policy Act, I, I read what everybody else has read. You know, there's uh, exclusive exemptions for high volume slick water hydraulic fracturing for uh, Clean Air and Clean Water Acts, RECRA, all the things that are were in place to protect the public from harm, you know, to, to, to make sure that we have clean air and clean water. With those exemptions, I was reading that and I was like, oh, yeah, you know, and, and this was just yeah, maybe a, about a year ago now. And I was, I was reading this and, and People had known this that the 2005 Energy Policy, Policy Act, the so-called Halliburton loophole, had given exclusive ex exemption to this technology. But when I read that whole 2005 Energy Policy Act, I also noted that there was a, an invention of a new position within the U.S. Department of Energy, and that was the, the Undersecretary of Science for the U.S. Department of Energy. And that position was invented or installed by the 2005 Energy Policy Act. And the first person to hold that position, his name was Dr. Ray Orbach. Now, Ray um, was a big proponent of fundamental science. He ran us for it. He came out. He did a lot of site visits with us. <clears throat> but somehow, the funding still <laughs> started to go down when he got in there. I can't tell you, like, after uh, how, how awakened I became, shocked, when I found out that Ray Orbach was the director of the 
uh, Energy Institute for UT Austin. And Ray Orbach was interviewed heavily at the last AAAS meeting, the American Association for the Advancement of Science meeting in, in Vancouver in February of, the, of 2012, where he had a press release uh, about a grand challenge report from his, uh, the Energy Institute of UT Austin, um, where they, the, the bottom line was, and this is what he was saying, that his investigative team, which included uh, Professor Chip Grote, who was the, uh, the leader of this team, a, um, I think they call him uh, eco uh, geological economist, a, uh, a woman, uh, a lawyer uh, from Florida State University who uh, had a background in uh, the legal aspects of lease agreements. And the, the last person on this grand challenge team was the, the director of PR for UT Austin. So this was their grand challenge team. And that team, and what Ray and Chip Grote declared at the AAAS meeting, was that hydraulic fracturing does not contaminate groundwater. That's what they found. Subsequently, this, this uh, document, or this, this report, that they said had been peer-reviewed, was in fact not peer-reviewed. And now we all know also that Chip Grote has received somewhere as of $1.2 million from the shale gas industry for his personal account, that uh, the Energy Institute of UT Austin is supportive of the industry itself, that helps to fund the activities in there. The whole concept that our Undersecretary for the U.S. Department of Energy, who also was the chair of two of the panels established by Secretary Stephen Chu, the Secretary of the U.S. Department of Energy, the chair of a session of EPA and Department of Energy representatives to address the issues of environmental impact of hydraulic fracturing. <laughs> Ray, Ray picked eight uh, industry representatives and one left-wing radical environmentalist. And so after their 90 days, where they're supposed to have a final report, after 90 days, their conclusion was, we, uh, we haven't done anything. We, we, we need to start over. So they were awarded another 90 days. And this was from President Obama and Stephen Chu. And again, nothing was done. The third, the, 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 the conclusion there was, Ray Orbach was not a positive influence on what was happening, and so they dispensed with him. So they installed, and you can look at all the history of these, of these panels. The third round of this, this was after the earthquakes in Youngstown, Ohio were recorded. You know, U.S. Geological Survey confirmed that uh, deep well injection in near Youngstown, Ohio, uh, caused a uh, 4.0 magnitude earthquake, I think it was on New Year's Day. <clears throat> so now this, this, this uh, uh, Obama included now the U.S. Geological Survey with the EPA and the, uh, and the Department of Energy. And they, I think that they were in their fourth iteration of this committee that has produced nothing. Do you under I mean, this is, this is a delay, a delay, a delay. And every time, my, from my perspective, in my opinion, this is a tactic basically to, uh, this tactic of establishing a, a panel that was designed for failure is something that you can just continue to delay and appease or pacify people from saying, oh, they're, doing, they're, they're addressing this. The U.S. federal government is addressing this. I don't believe that they're taking a sincere effort in that in, in the address. I would like to have better understanding of, of how this has progressed since not just 2005, but probably starting back in the late 90s, where the technology of, of uh, uh, directional drilling was really uh, first being demonstrated. And uh, I would also like to have a little bit more information about the computer code uh, that was generated uh, with $60 million of U.S. taxpayers' dollars going to the U.S. Department of Energy to uh, be able to interpret um, the seismic um, signals that come out of these deep formations when, when you discharge and you can see a lot of the seismic activity going on, maybe not around here right now, but 
in other in southwest Pennsylvania, the the, the seismologists are all over the place, or the, the seismic crews are everywhere. But you, to be able to you know determine well, first of all, where those formations are, um, what are the likely components, where, what is the best way to extract gas out of this, you have to have those computer codes. Now those computer codes are no longer accessible to the U.S. scientific core. We don't have access to them. This was licensed out principally to the Halliburton Corporation for um, use in their systems. $60 million of U.S. taxpayers' dollars. And you can go online. And but the scientific community doesn't have access to the source code on this? Absolutely not. This is proprietary. Now this has been licensed to these companies. And, oh man, I can't remember his name. Mitchell, the guy in Texas that developed the whole, is it Mitchell is his last name? I'm sorry, it, it slipped in my mind. But he, he's, he's on the web. You can go in and thanking the U.S. government for their contributions. They couldn't have done it without <laughs> the U.S. Department of Energy's computational skills. <clears throat> I, I think the, US, the, 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 the American people should stand up and ask what's going on with their funds that they're, they're pushing into this system. Why don't we have competent scientists? Look, we had a, um, again, our, our uh, annual meeting of the, it's called the Principal Investigators Meeting for the Subsurface Science Research Programs within the Department of Energy. And in this room, I think we held it in March or April of this year, 250 scientists at least in a, in a room discussing like we did every year but this year it was like you know what are we going to do without any funding you know how are we going to restructure it like people are, are losing their funding and people at national labs are being laid off or fired uh, because of lack of support <clears throat> when we had a small breakout session on hydraulic fracturing and the scientific opportunities to actually do some really deep deep subsurface science research nobody for, I mean, maybe 5% of the people in the room had ever even heard of it. Now we're talking about, like, the, the group of people in the entire world most capable of addressing the issues related to the environmental impact of what we're doing to the subsurface. And they know nothing about the, this, the, this technology. They have no access to fund their research. I mean, looking in on it again, the only conclusion that I can draw was that this was a calculated strategy to get rid of those people that had the capabilities to be able to contribute real science to this issue. And uh, I personally, and, and I don't mind saying this on camera, Ray Orbach was really like forthright. You want me to cut this or something? Look, I have a discussion. I want to have an open discussion with it. I want to understand what the hell happened to those science programs because again it was you know it was personally it was uh, you know motivating it was it was fulfilling to be able to work with these great scientists even if we couldn't clean up the Hanford site for instance we understood basic processes subsurface science process I mean subsurface uh, interactions between bacteria hydrology geochemistry we, we were good I mean they're, 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 the world recognized us and now People are being laid off in these national labs? No. Nah, something's up. And we, we need to really look in and see, and see what's going on. So, Well, it certainly seems that the U.S. Department of Energy is in no state right now to do an in-depth analysis on hydrofracking. And that report from Energy Institute of UT Austin definitely seemed tainted. But what's interesting about that report is if you actually read it, in the summary conclusion section before the final summary conclusion you'll see that it actually identifies a lot of the major issues it identifies that the press is re overwhelmingly reporting negative issues on the process that there's large number of antidotal reports of issues and that even scientists are making claims that there are serious issues in spite of that, the final summary conclusion paragraph seems to go against the spirit of the report and say that there's no evidence of water contamination through hydrofracking. It's almost a just disjointed report. So, in conclusion, I'm going to leave you with a soundbite from the 
testimony from the New York State Assembly when they had a hearing on hydrofracking. And this is testimony from numerous environmental groups. And of course, what's most important of all is what's your opinion? Take care. It can't be disputed anymore. So I say to you, how can it be that four years we're still doing this process? So I guess we're starting to feel that this is even more than about hydrofracking. It really is. It is about who determines the fate of New York. Is it a corporate interest or is it the public interest? When I hear corporation representatives come here and tell you to, that it is foolish, and that's a quote, to continue studying something we don't know enough about and we need to take action, action, that tells me that they really are representing a self-interest and not the public interest. But fortuitously, your obligation is the public interest. So we want, I mean, I've been around three decades, and we need to be able to feel confident and have faith in our DEC.